Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today we have two speakers, Michael Karani and Alexander Andrasson. Michael graduated from a PhD in African languages in March 2018 from Stellenbosch University, and he currently works as lecturer and director in the Center for Communication Studies in the College of Humanities at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. He conducted research on morphology and syntax on the two dialects of Maasai spoken in Tanzania, namely Arusha and Parabuyo, during his MA and his PhD, respectively. His area of interest is documentation of African languages and morphology and syntax in particular. Alexander is a linguist working as a lecturer in the Department of Ancient Studies at Stellenbosch University, where he teaches Semitic and Afroasiatic languages, and he teaches in the departments of African languages and general linguistics as well. The scope of his research is very broad and includes the areas of linguistics, cognitive science, complexity theory, philosophy, and open data. He specializes in cognitive linguistics and its various subtypes, especially semantics and morphosyntics, social linguistics and language context, grammaticalization theory and typology. His language interests are similarly broad and among many others include Indo-European, Afroasiatic and Niger-Congo languages. Through various fieldworks and community interaction, he also contributed to the description and visibility of under-researched and or minority languages in Tanzania, um, among which uh, uh, the language of Arusha, which is a topic today. Um, and he also worked in Zimbabwe and in Gambia. Please join me in welcoming Michael and Alexander as they give their talk, Cognitive Calls to Animals from Arusha Maasai to a Cross-Linguistic Prototype. Um, now, um, Alexander is not what is here today, so I'm gonna start the video, um, but Michael will be presenting live, so we will also be here for questions afterwards. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk that is dedicated to Cognitive Animal Calls in Maasai and also the development of a cross-linguistic prototype of this very interesting linguistic grammatical category. The present research is developed within a broader research project cluster that is dedicated to interjections in many language families and then that, that has been carried out in Stellenbosch University in co collaboration with many universities in Africa and Europe. This uh, interjection project cluster uh, includes or is dedicated to three main types of uh, languages, Semitic languages, Indo-European languages, and African languages. Uh, within Semitic languages, we've carried out, well, this is the project that already had, uh, has concluded, and we studied the interject, interjected category in Hebrew, Aramaic, Ugaritic, and Kalana Akkadian. In Indo-European languages, we studied uh, the, uh, a, a type of interjections, namely latter interjections in Polish, the syntax of interjections in Greek, and currently I carry a study dedicated to syntax, to, to the syntax of interjections in Latin. Within African languages, we have published, we have studied and published uh, several papers dedicated to Xhosa, Southern Bantu language. Uh, specifically to the uh, the interjective ca category in its uh, totality, to the syntax of interjections and to latter interjections. We also studied uh, interjections in uh, in a uh, Khoi language Chuao, and currently are conducting research dedicated to interjections in Hausa together with Michael, Andrew, and uh, Richard. Uh, within. Uh, this uh, cluster of, uh, of interjection projects, uh, a prominent part is dedicated to Maasai. And part of this research on interjections is developed within a broader Maasai project, which uh, studies uh, what we call the expressive grammar of, of Asai, and that includes interjections, idiophones, and, uh, and gestures. And within this project, we have currently, uh, we have already studied emotive interjections in, in uh, Arusha. This paper is currently under review. We currently, uh, we, we are conducting a study on, on idiophones in Arusha, specifically they, they, 
the phonetics, morphology, and syntax. And we conducted a study dedicated to collative animal calls, which are the topic of our uh, presentation uh, today. So uh, our study uh, dedicated to collective calls in Arusha that we are presenting right now has two principal goals. On the one hand, we wanted to expand the empirical evidence related to conative calls in the languages of the world uh, and offer a detailed and principled description of this category in uh, Arusha, which is a Tanzanian uh, variety of Maasai. On the other hand, uh, by contrasting our observation concerning conative calls in Maasai with the properties observed in other languages, we wanted to design a cross-linguistic prototype of this category. What do we know about cats? What are conative animal calls? Conative animal calls, or cacks as we uh, refer to them um, in, in, in our paper, are a subtype of conative interjections. And, and as all conatives, they communicate volitive states of the speaker and express wishes, desires, orders, commands, and intentions of, uh, yeah, of, of, of the speaker. Uh, what do we know about cacks? Uh, cacks are definitely uh, the most under-researched type of conative uh, interjections and probably the least studied type of all interjections in general. Uh, to our knowledge, there are only two articles that uh, have specifically been dedicated to conative calls. One of them concerns a Berber variety. It's, this is the paper uh, offered by Bynon in 1776, and the other was dedicated to a homotic variety uh, written by Amhai in 2013. There are also sporadic mentions to some type of uh, conative calls, calls in Ewe, Matses, Polish, uh, Chosa, and Chuao, but these are uh, few and rather unsystematic uh, observations. Uh, the evident result of this scarcity of research on conative calls in specific languages, which I mentioned before, is the absence of any systematic studies devoted to this category from a cross-linguistic perspective. The only uh, uh, few generalizations related to the category of conative calls may be found in a, in a book written by Poyatos, Wierzbicka in 2003, then in, a, in another book written, in a chapter in a book written by Eichenwald and in the paper by Amha. So it is not surprise that um, at the beginning of this uh, century, Poyatos in his uh, quite an influential book concluded that conative calls uh, constitute an area in desperate need of serious and systematic uh, research. In order to study conative calls in a systematic and principled manner, we of course, we have to have a framework. In our research, uh, we use a what we call a synthetic framework that combines features typical of canonical typology and prototype theory. And in most general way, we see a category, in this case, ca the category of conative calls, as a radial network structured around a prototype or a prototypical conative call. Uh, this this uh, th this this model this framework draws on on two important features. On the one hand, the category is structured around a prototype, which is an ideal construct. The prototype is defined cumulatively through the, through a set of uh, prototypical properties that are identified because of the cross linguistic pervi pervasiveness of frequency as well as cognitive silence, such as or, or, or distinctiveness in, relation, uh, in comparison with any other, especially closely related categories and, and uh, grammatical, uh, yeah, grammatical categories. On the other hand, realistic uh, conative calls or conative calls attested in, uh, in, uh, in actual languages can be more or less canonical uh, instantiations of this prototype. They can approximate or comply with the, with the uh, they can approximate prototype or comply with prototypical feature to a lesser or greater uh, extent. Those that are canonical comply with all or most features and they are located in the center of the category. Those that are non-canonical 
uh, comply with few features or, or, or a number of them and are located in, a, in, in, the, in the periphery of the, of the category. So the category is very flexible. Uh, it can extend from uh, canonical uh, centers that match the prototype, prototype closely to members that are very non-canonical and uh, uh, comply only with a few prototypical features. Our findings come from uh, the feed work, uh, which was carried out at the end of 2020 and uh, at the beginning of uh, this year uh, in, uh, in northern Tanzania in the, in the Arusha region. Uh, I will talk only about semantic and pragmatic component or uh, semantics and pragmatics of conative calls. Michael will take you through the formal aspects of uh, conative calls and we'll talk about uh, their morpho uh, phonology of phonetics, morphology, and syntax. So overall, we collected 46 lexemes uh, <clears throat> that can be viewed as lexicalized directives that communicate requests, wishes, desires, demands, orders, directives to animals. Uh, so the principal semantic com component of Arusha uh, conative calls or their meaning uh, is related to an action that is requested uh, of an animal. Uh, this action uh, overwhelmingly implies some type of motion. There are 42 uh, conative call calls related to motion, which can be of three main types, motion uh, uh, to come close, this category is called samosens, such as kula kula, uh, motion uh, or, or the, the order to given to animal to go away, this category is called dispersals, such as shomo, to, to disperse animals, and uh, a broad category of other directives that are used to start, stop or modify the motion of the, of the animal, to start motion, motion ino, sustain motion suk, and stop motion wall. Nevertheless, I'm sorry, nevertheless, uh, actions that do not necessitate the animal to change its position can also be expressed by conative calls, both in Arusha and uh, in other languages. In Arusha, we found six such uh, uh, lexemes, and the most common subtype uh, of uh, conative calls that are you, that 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 are unrelated to the ideal motion involves uh, uh, attention getters such as kine. <clears throat> uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, conative calls is used with domestic animals. There are forty four such conative calls. Uh, Sixteen of them are dedicated to or used to address goats and sheep, like aria aria, 13 to address cows, bulls and oxen, mape, seven are directed to donkeys, for instance, cook, and uh, a limited lower number of uh, conative calls uh, is emplo uh, are employed uh, to address pets, especially dogs. We have eight lexemes like that. And two are dedicated uh, address to, to cats. So domestic animals are compatible with all semant all semantic types of uh, of conative calls, whether summonses, dispersals, or directives. With uh, wild animals uh, or conative calls dedicated to wild animals, only instantiate the dispersal semantic type uh, in Arusha. And they are mainly dedicated or addressed to uh, wolves, hyenas, and monkeys. Cross-linguistically, uh, wild animal uh, conative calls also tend to be uh, less common and uh, typically limited to dispersals. And quite often, they are just extended forms, uh, uh, forms extended from the uh, from those that are used with dom domestic uh, species. Uh, this is, of course, evident for farming and pastoral uh, communities as well as industrialized societies. But even in communities characteristic of food gathering, hunting, fishing economy, uh, uh, genuine wild animal conative calls, uh, that is, uh, lexemes that are linguistic rather than paralinguistics, are usually uh, limited to dispersals, 
while the other semantic types are merely uh, non-speech imitations of animal calls. Uh, cognitive calls are typically monosemous and highly specialized. And this semantic specialization stems from the fact that uh, a prototypical cognitive call combines the specific action with which it communicates with the specific reference to which it is addressed. So for instance, kine is produced to get the attention of a goat. Kukukuku is, is produced to summon, uh, to summon chickens. Um, these two uh, cognitive calls are used to summon dogs and even different whistles are used to summon a dog that is far away or that is close away. So cacks are extremely uh, specialized semantically. Sometimes this spe spe uh, specification or specialization concerns even the age or the sex of an animal within a single species, uh, which means that different cacks can be used uh, with young or old animals as well as uh, or with uh, male and, and female uh, reference. Uh, nevertheless, certain types of more or less extensive polysemy are also attested and uh, some CACs can communicate more than one type of action. They may be, semi, uh, they, they may be compatible with similar animals such as goat and sheep, bull, oxen and cows, uh, cows and a few cognitive cows are compatible with even with unrelated species. Uh, lastly, uh, cognitive calls are inherently, if not tautologically, dialogical and deliberate. They presuppose the participation of the part other than the speaker themselves, that is, the recipient of, the, of a wish, a desire, demand, or order, in our case, an animal. Therefore, cognitive calls very regularly appear in interspecies communications and communi all communicative episodes. And by communicating these wishes, desires, demands or orders of the human speaker, cognitive calls are also inherently intentional and deliberate. And of course, this property by itself is not uh, anything special, particular, but it is important. This, dialog uh, this dialogical and deliber deliberative character is very important because it the, the, both properties distinguish cognitive calls from many other interjections, especially emotive interjections in, 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 in Arusha and uh, across, across languages. So these were the most typical properties associated with the, a prototypical cognitive call in Arusha and across languages as far as uh, semantics and pragmatics are concerned. And now Michael will take you through, through the phonetics, morphology and syntax of uh, cognitive calls in Maasai and uh, in other, other languages. Hi everyone, you all see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take you through the phonetics uh, part um, of our talk. And uh, to start with, we have uh, phonetic uh, properties, a few phonetic properties that are, are observed in, in uh, cognitive animal calls in Arusa. And one of the features is that uh, these calls exhibit a consonantal nature the sense that most of them, or at least um, you know, primary uh, cognitive calls in Arusa um, are built up by sequence of consonants. Uh, so for example, we have um, examples like s, s, or sh, when you want to disperse cows, um, but also we have clicks. Uh, when you want to stop a donkey, for example, you would use uh, clicks like so there's a sequence of clicks, and and um, we also have uh, other examples like suk suk. So with suk we have s to show that it, this consonant is elongated. So this is one of the unique features um, um, of cognitive cause um, in Arusa, and um, these sounds or. Uh, these consonants, for example, some of them are not in the, in the regular grammar of Arusa. So generally we are saying that these sounds, some are foreign to human language, for example, 
uh, in general, because we have um, calls like whistles or, or calling a dog, uh, which you know you can't find them in the sound inventory of you know word languages. But also some are foreign to Maasai. Um, uh, we have seen examples of clicks and. Uh, clicks are not the regular, um, you know, sound um, phonemes uh, in in Narosa, and so we only find uh, clicks in injections and connect animal calls. And so this is something unique uh, in, in this respect. And uh, looking at phonetics further, um, we have some super segmental operations that we can analyze in these uh, connective animal calls in Narosa. So one of the operations is having extend, extended um, uh, formation, prolongation, some are replicated or repeated. So um, I, I mentioned about clicks, in, in, in which case we, we repeat those clicks in order to make sure that uh, you communicate what you want, what you want to communicate to, to a particular animal. Um, but repetition is also very common. So you can have examples like suk, 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 or shh, shh, shh. So you keep repeating the, the, the call or, yeah, or the utterance until the animal responds in the way that you want them um, to respond. Um, but also there are some um, phonation, intensity, um, loudness, but also rate, or, a speed uh, in which you pronounce uh, uh, these calls. Um, these are unique to uh, connective animal calls. Um, in, in any case, you can't find um, most of the um, this phonetic properties in uh, regular language. Um, so um, another feature is that uh, this kind of suprasegmental properties um, communicate something unique to uh, connective cause. So for example, um, with loudness or rapid falling intonation, um, we have puncture and then prolongation, you find it when you have a slowly falling intonation. So something that is elongated, it's a little bit uh, slowly pronounced, uh, but also replication uh, correlates to a uniform or slightly falling intonation. Um, when you want to repeat, then you, you find that there's a falling intonation, uh, a slower pace, slower a little bit, but also you find pauses. So these are features that we, we think are interesting and uh, could be easily um, demonstrated using uh, connective animal cause. And these features also correlate with different motion types. So for example, for, for salmon says, we have lengthening as a feature that is evident in most of the salmon tokens we've collected, uh, but also we have replication or repetition. Um, so you, 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 we have reduplicated uh, forms of cognitive cause, but also repetition of the same uh, several times. Uh, but also a friendly intonation. Uh, we, we saw this, for example, in different types of whistles. So the whistles are, um, have a melodic kind of structure, but also uh, the Maasai people would kind of make whistles that uh, relate to some songs or some, you know, yeah, mostly songs um, that they, they have in, the, in, the, in their culture. Um, for dispersers, um, dispersing animals or chasing them away, you will find features like raised voice. So you, 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 you pronounce it with a little bit uh, of force, but also speed and, and repetition as well. Uh, remember, um, we don't have a limit uh, in terms when it comes to repetition. As I said, uh, it depends on um, the response of an animal. Um, so you only stop when you see some response, a positive response from an animal. Uh, but also for directives, uh, for example, a go type directive, uh, you have a puncture, uh, short syllable and raised the voice. So you have uh, lexical uh, uh, words, for example, like mahabi, um, um, shomo, 
So those are examples. Uh, you have continue um, that correlates um, to short syllables and raised the voice as well. But also we have stop type kind of motion, uh, which is uh, characteristic of prolongation. As I said, we use clicks, for example, or sometimes whistles like when you want to stop uh, oxen, uh, for example, when cultivating, you want to stop an ox, uh, or when you want to catch an ox, you, you Arusta speakers tend to use um, a certain types of whistles um, that are elongated, uh, depending on you know um, the response of an animal. So uh, we look at morphology, morphological uh, structure of uh, cognitive animal calls. Um, to start with, we, we, we say that most of, most of them are primary. So we have uh, simple forms that are uniquely or solely used for uh, connective calls. In another sense, in, in other words, you cannot use them in, 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 in regular in anything else. Uh, but also we have borrowed ones um, or uh, words that basically uh, mean something, but they can also be used to direct animals, either to ask them to stop or ask them to move away. Um, and most of the basic or primary uh, cognitive animal cause are monomorphic in, in the sense that they, they are only one morphine. You can't um, divide or separate a uh, word into different uh, 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 affixes, for example. Um, so you can't have several segments or uh, you know any segments like having reflection, derivation of morphemes or compound um, words. Um, another morphological feature uh, in in cognitive animal cause is that looking at their structure, we think they are unique. Um, the structure is very unique. In that sense, we say it's extra systematic. Uh, is the structure that doesn't allow other regular processes of the uh, of the language to apply, for example, reflection and reflection. Um, uh, having such features, we 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 look at it as a little bit uh, opaque or structurally opaque in the sense that because we don't have um, suffixes to make connective animal cause, um, we don't have any classifiers of any kind to make these kind of words. We think um, they, they, you can't predict, um, say, for example, you're not a native speaker of the language, looking at the word structure, you can't predict whether this is um, a connective animal call or uh, any other word because we don't take uh, this uh, uh, regular or conventional uh, word uh, building blocks or particles. And then we get to syntax. Um, syntactically, uh, we use we can use cognitive animal cause as lexical items, but also they can stand independently to to communicate or to function, uh, as it were. And having them as independent, they can also be integrated in the clause of structure. Uh, so um, the the the, the uh, individual uh, items that can be uttered to communicate or direct an animal. And those individual tokens, for example, the imperatives, assume inherent second person uh, referent that it is an animal, you see an animal here, you, you say, Mari, Tomo, or Nakite, or Wu. So those verbs assume that the, the referent is close or nearby and you are you communicate uh, to, to them as, uh, you know, as you see them. Uh, but also some of these secondary uh, cuts items um, are intransitive, but also some are transitive. And that means they project arguments. Um, so you can use vocatives to mention. Um, in master, we, we, we get names to cow, so you can name the cow, uh, but also it allows some adjuncts. Uh, in a closed structure. Um, in other cases, we can also see these uh, items uh, being modified by other particles, as, as we shall see. 
Um, so talking about other particles, um, I have an example here. So I mentioned about mentioning the name of the cow, uh, but also um, you can say, whoa, whoa, who in it? So a ne is here. So you call a cow, for example, saying come, and then you can have another particle saying here, uh, modifying a connective animal call. But also imperative verbs are common um, in secondary uh, connective animal calls. They can be modified also by multiple adjections, and they can occur with other connective animal calls. So uh, one quick example uh, to exemplify this is that you can say nakine. So nakine is, if you were to translate literally, you say you, you got. So uh, nakine, and then you can, can be followed by a whistle. Um, there, there, there are different types of whistles. So you can uh, whistle to call or indicate that you want them to come closer. Also, can be followed by other uh, connective animal calls for gods like I, I. So you can say, Makine, I, I. So that's a sequence of uh, connective animal calls that can be called cow. Um, but also, looking at the, the, the position of uh, these items in a closed uh, structure, um, typically they occur in the initial. So they can occur in, in, in final position. Um, and in this case, they occur in final position. That means there are other particles or items that uh, precede. And could be a case of um, information structure, what you want to emphasize. And uh, maybe to finalize, um, uh, yeah, we have a coding part from Alex, so uh, I will allow um, Anne to play the second part of Alex's video. Thank you. The present paper was dedicated to the prototype of uh, collative animal calls, and we mainly drew on Maasai data. Uh, as well as uh, the data provided by Bynum 1976 and Amhart 2013. We complemented our, uh, our, our data with the evidence related to a few other languages, such as Ewe, Matzes, Polish, Kasa, and Chihuahua. This is, of course, a very, very limited sample, cross-linguistic sample of, of languages, and so we are full, fully aware of it. And therefore, the prototype proposed here is certainly a, uh, a, a tentative uh, prototype. What we plan to do uh, in future is uh, a much more comprehensive study dedicated to the typology of animal calls, which I plan to start uh, next year. And for that study, we selected uh, a large number of uh, languages that uh, 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 represent much more representative that uh, represent several branches and families uh, linguistic branches and, and, and families and here you can find the uh, all these languages uh, specified and uh, this what we believe to be a much more comprehensive and representative sample of languages will allow us to test and verify uh, uh, to test our prototype and verify whether uh, the prototypical property that we have postulated in our paper and in this talk uh, are actually validated uh, cross-linguistically or, which is much more likely, whether in certain aspects this prototype, prototype will need to have, uh, will, will need to be uh, uh, improved or, or, or rectified. Uh, this study will start uh, hopefully next year. Uh, much of the of of uh, of the data has uh, have uh, has already been uh, collected uh, in 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 several languages, and we hope that this study will really be uh, groundbreaking in uh, in in at least in the field of cognitive 
calls. Thank you very much for your attention, for participating in this uh, talk. And if you have any questions, we will be very happy to, to, to answer them. And also, if you would like to, to have a copy of the paper uh, dedicated to, to uh, cognitive animal calls in Maasai, as well as, as well as any other paper dedicated to Maasai that Michael and I wrote together, or any other paper dedicated to interjections within our interjection project cluster, you are most welcome to, to, to write, send us an email and we will ha happily share with you all uh, research that, uh, that we have done. Thank you very much for your attention and, uh, and have a wonderful day. All right, thank you very much, uh, Michael and Alexander, for uh, your presentation. So with that, we can go to the question and answer section. Uh, the question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hands in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question, this is also possible. Just write it in the chat. And as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinar is being recorded, so if you ask a voice question, this will be part of the recording and it will be released on the YouTube channel. And um, yeah, from Hope, Morgan was first. Am I un I'm unmuted now. Uh, yeah, I have a, a question. Um, gesture was mentioned in the, uh, I don't see, where's our speaker? Oh, there we are, sorry. <laughs> Too many things on the screen. Uh, uh, Michael, yes, so mid gesture was mentioned. And I'm curious to know if you when you collected the data, you got video? Or is this something that you plan to do later? And if you did collect any information, what have you found? Thank you Hope, for your interesting question. Um, <clears throat> yes, I guess the company uh, many of these um, um, connective animal cause. And because most of it happened in, in a natural setting and um, we, we couldn't record a video to illustrate them but as a native speaker i can i can think of uh, several gestures that accompany uh, this cause so for example um, in most cases when you are dispersing animals you would use your hand to wave uh, animals to go away or um, when you are calling them to come together or you want to collect them, now you'd use, use your stick, uh, wave your stick and, and show the direction uh, that you want them to drive. So uh, typically these are kind of gestures that you know, uh, accompany uh, animal calls. Thank you. Um, I think Hope maybe wanted to reply. I saw you looking for the mute button, I think. But... Yeah. I did. I had a follow up question, but now I can't. Um, it, well, it opens up many um, other questions about the, the gestures, for example. Oh, I know the question that I wanted to ask is um, you have you can have uh, terms that you can refer to uh, animals, but not people or vice versa. And in some places, you can also have gestures that you could use for a person, but not an animal and vice versa. Do you, are there any gestures that you know of that are only used for the animals, uh, but not people or the opposite? Like for height, I, one um, example is height, like how high something is. This is a bit outside of your calls, your, your cognitive uh, constructions, but I'm just curious, would you even expect to have different gestures for people and animals? Um, re responding to your question, I, I remember a um, few cases that can be used um, um, to to call, for example, uh, a dog. So you can you can use your hands, uh, your fingers like this. This is typically to call a dog to come closer to you or play with your dog um, by uh, using this. And um, think about other animals like cat or goat or um, I think we, it's something we have to really explore um, um, further to see if there are some cases that are uniquely um, specifically used for animals, uh, like the, what we have in human being communication, for example. Thank you. And I see a raised hand from Ahmed. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My question is, um, I have noticed that in the presentation, um, none of these examples of the calls is written. And I'm just wondering how uh, you are going to present it. Are you going, some of them is said that they are extra systematic and it's not uh, easy to use, for example, IPA or something like that to, to write them. So I'm just wondering if uh, you won't write them or publish, how are you going to represent these uh, different kinds of calls uh, using audio in a website or you're going to use the uh, what kind of writing to present that? Uh, thanks, Ahmed. Um, uh, the way we represent this is using IPA symbols, and, and um, we collected uh, these tokens uh, using a database, uh, an Excel sheet. Um, I could actually show you uh, just quickly if I can share my screen. Uh, Anna, do you allow me? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so um, looking at this data, see this data screen. Um, do you all see this database? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, so you can see that we use IPA symbols to uh, transcribe um, these uh, tokens. So uh, definitely, even you can see for clicks, we use uh, these symbols and and. And um, you know any linguist. We hope that any linguist will, should be able to pronounce them. And even in our paper, uh, we we try to you know transcribe and and show how one can translate. Except for um, a few aspects like whistles. So we kind of describe the melody, um, repetition, elongation, uh, intensity of types of whistles. Um, I'm sure. I mean. <laughs> We, we couldn't find any way to represent them using any kind of symbol. So with the words, for example, we believe it should be able to, you know, uh, to be understandable uh, to linguists. Then I see Bonnie has raised her hands. Oh, hi. I was struck by your comment that the there's a diagic form of communication with the animals. It uh, reminded me of Antonio uh, Benitez Baracco's work on language as self-domestication of humans. You know, so the wild animals you <laughs> don't seem to have as much of a dialogue with as with the domestic animals. I, I just think that that's an interesting uh, thought to pursue. And I'm wondering when animals have calls warning calls about certain animals, I, I would say that that's probably not dialogic across species, or are there any cases that you're aware of where an animal might have a call that's dialogic across species? Well, I guess I, we all see our dogs and cats <laughs> make noises that are, are dialogic with us. Um, thanks, Bonnie, for your comment. And I think um, we, we, I mean, the relationship between human and wild animals is a bit, you know, um, you know, not that much um, uh, friendly. So um, we could only um, get some um, calls for monkeys and 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 for example, when you want to hunt um, an ant an antelope or um, you know those animals that can be eaten, uh, you, you you can use some calls saying. Hey, 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 oh, why, why? And, and that means you are, you're actually alerting your friend or your company that there's an antelope here, we have to chase it or, a, a, you know, go for it. And for dangerous animals, uh, definitely we don't use, um, I, don't, I don't remember any kind of cause because um, the moment you provoke them, then it is, it's a dangerous situation. So. Um, mostly what you see is that if you see a dangerous animal, be it a lion or a leopard, you would kind of move away slowly um, so that to avoid get hurt. So, um, so that, that, that's how it, it, it works in Maasai. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I, I've answered or responded to your comment correctly. Thank you. Bonnie, did you want to respond to that? Or? 
No, it was just just a just an observation. But I, I would also point out that the extension of the I, IPA, the X IPA, might have some symbols that might be helpful for some of the uh, nuances of the sounds. And certainly with the clicks, we don't have uh, a sort of adequate diacritics to explain some of the differences, say with the bilabials that you were you were talking about, whether a bilabial has a very abrupt onset or a very more kind of a slow onset, like uh, that one dog sound you're making, I wasn't sure if that was click alternating with an ejective kind of bilabial or what was going on there, that sound. <laughs> uh, Actually, that, uh, that yeah, the, the bilabial click is actually um, so you uh, inhale air in as you, 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 you make it. So it's a, so your lips come in contact and then you inhale air uh, inside. But you had another one listed that you, you said was a, a sort of, you had one that you transcribed with the bilabial click symbol and another that you didn't on the list that you showed there, one that you had written with a capital B. Yeah, maybe we're trying. We're trying to differentiate and oh, okay. it's like, um, yeah. So that gets back to DA's last talk with the protrusion versus the compression of the lips. Yeah. I see that uh, Bonnie also posted some uh, references for you in the chat, so I'll make sure to email them to you. Uh, once it's complete. Um, I just have a curiosity actually, um, because I don't know anything about the Rusa, but it's, um, so a lot of the calls you say are summoned for uh, animals, for example. So do you find that these are often, um, I mean, basically the, the, the animal name being called over and over again, or are they completely different? So for example, if you would be calling out for a dog, or maybe that's not the right word, but for a goat, for example, is it basically shouting goat, 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 or is it something else? Um, when, when, when you, uh, you, when you are calling a god, for example, um, mm -hmm. uh, many gods, you would use, um, um, a singular, a singular name, say God. So you keep repeating saying God, God, God. Um, so, uh, we assume that you'd be moving, moving around or moving to the direction you want to drive them or, uh, accompanying your, 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 your call with the gesture, for example. Um, until they respond the way you want them to respond. But in case um, where you have few, uh, you can call their name, for example. Or you can assign names. We have common names for cows, for example, say Sawadi, Sawadi, Sawadi. So if, if, if the cow, studying the environment or the context uh, of the call, if, if the cow was moving away and then you call the name, it will definitely look at you and, 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 and try to respond to the, uh, to, to, to I think we lost you in the connection a bit. Yeah, so for, um, um, I think connection broke a little bit. Should I repeat the last part? Uh, yes, please. I think now you're fine. <laughs> yeah, so I was saying that if, if you're addressing a, an individual a cow, for example, and you have a name for that cow, you, you'll call it. And it will definitely respond based on the nature on, or the, 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 the intention of the call. By studying the environment, for example, um, um, looking at you, it will look at you definitely. And if you keep calling, then it will come closer to you. And for, for example, calling many gods, you'd use a single uh, name for a god, and that is Kine. So you'll keep repeating saying, Kine, 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 and probably running. Um, um, and toss certain direction and drive them to certain direction, direction you want. So we use a singular, even when you want to call for, you know, um, get the attention of many gods. But if you have uh, one god or a cow assigned with a name, you can call it and you definitely respond. Thank you, very interesting. Very interesting. It's a bit of an echo. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Ah, CTJ's raised his hands physically. Hi, uh, Michael. Uh, just one little question. I may have missed something in your presentation, 
But can we consider that uh, uh, Maasai people develop a kind of whistle language uh, or a whistling language to exchange, for example, when people are hunting or something like that? Yeah, thanks, Didier, for your question. Um, um, talking about whistles, we have roughly five types of whistles, and we have short ones and, and longer ones. And uh, depending on the on the kind of message you want to send to animals, we have whistles, for example, for stopping animals, um, like you want to stop an ox or make it uh, polite and calm so that you, you catch it and put a yoke over, over its neck or something like that. So you would use uh, whistles like <whistles> and you have whistles that you use to collect uh, gods. Um, many of them are a little bit far away so these ones will be longer and 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 uh, with a high volume. Um, but also, uh, you have some shorter wh uh, whistles to disperse them or move them or ask them to uh, continue moving. Uh, but also, when you, you can find a Maasai uh, warrior, for example, in the bush with a, um, a kettle or a lot of goats, and they are grazing, they are eating grass. And then Maasai uh, st can stand in uh, one of the corner and then making uh, a, a melodic kind of whistle. You, you could equate with it with a, with a slow song just to calm them, uh, make them grace uh, um, peacefully, but also telling them that you are, you are there, you're looking, uh, taking care of them and so they shouldn't worry. So that's kind of, um uh, kind of a blues music during lunch time okay so, <laughs> because i think there is one thing that uh, cattle herders are usually de can develop with the language to exchange it at a distance which the spoken form of uh, of the language cannot ca cannot cannot do you can whistle at a greater distance than than you speak and as uh masai is a tone language is it possible to transfer the whistling in words later or the contrary? Um, I mean, may not curious, be. but. Yeah, um, it may not, it may not be um, something being practiced, but thinking about it linguistically or in a way that one would want to find ways to translate it. Yes, I think it's, it's, it's quite possible to do it. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I have a single question related to uh, the whistling. Sorry, and I just <laughs> jumped in. No worries, uh, go ahead. I'm just wondering uh, are whistles used for uh, to encourage animals to drink because you talk about eating, but uh, I know somewhere else in Africa where they use to, to encourage them to drink. Uh, I don't know if uh, the same is used. The melodies is different also to, to ask them to stop, we use whistling. And yeah, it's interesting that uh, it's the same in, in Arusha. Um, yes, thank you. I I don't remember instances where you find um, you know um, Arusa or Maasai speakers whistling when they drink water. Um, maybe because it's a short, um, um, it's, a, it's a very uh, short event, and um, depending on the kind of um, environment or where you take them to drink water, and in most cases. Um, they, they are used when they, 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 they eat grass and, and not when drinking. Yeah. Um, Hope? Uh, yeah, I have a question. It might be better suited for Alexander, but um, I, I assume you know has, uh, about this too. I'm curious, he was talking about a prototype and um, it makes me curious whether he wants to find something universal across all of these um, CAC constructions, um, or to what extent you, you know, you're going to focus on the difference between something that's systematic in the language versus 
peripheral to the language. And I, I just, can you say anything about this idea that there's a, a prototype? Um, thank you for your question. I think um, <clears throat> uh, talking about the prototype, um, we look at the properties that we, we use to analyze this kind of cause and um, having them across linguistically, um, you know, when we get a lot of data from different languages and see that probably most of them share the same properties, uh, formal, uh, that is phonetic, um, syntactic and morphological properties. And then one can think of establishing the, the prototype that um, conforms to most of the uh, properties that, uh, you know, have been attested in many languages. So um, in, in different languages where probably you find data that um, have less features that we think those are on the periphery or you know, you know on the, the periphery of the continuum. So uh, looking at it um, until we get um, most of the studies from different languages, then we can reach to a position to say, we can have uh, prototypes of connective um, uh, animal cause in the sense that they they show, they indicate, or we have some unique features that are salient in most of the data from different languages. Mm. Ah, thank you. Uh, I have a follow quick follow-up that I've just thought of in this conversation. Will you control for the environment? Because it sounds like the environment may be um, interact with the kinds of calls that you're getting based on what Ahmed was saying. Versus, anyway, yeah. So are, in the languages that, that are being chosen for this new project, uh, will you look at environment as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, environment may bring in some interesting features. So um, uh, having the, for example, pragmatics and semantics part is where we can describe um, some environmental contextual features that may, may you know, go together with, uh, some of the animal cause. Thank you. It was very interesting, by the way. Thanks. Thank you very much. I actually see that Alexander is joining us. So we do have him now if there's still anyone who would like to ask him a question. And I let me see if we are properly connected. Yeah, we are. Welcome, Alex. I'm so sorry. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> I wish that Hope repeats our question and you know we hear some comments from you. Hope, would you like to repeat your question now that Alex is here? <laughs> sure, I will. In fact, my hand was still up accidentally. <laughs> uh, so Alexander, thank you. Nice presentation. Um, I had a question about the um, your idea of the prototype, which Michael answered fairly well, but maybe I can direct the question about what you, if, if what you're looking for is to find something universal about these, these types um, or, or what, what your view of that is. Um, are you, yeah, does that, is that clear? Yes, yes, thank, thank you very much. I, I think uh, uh, as I explained in, in my part of the presentation, we drew on two types of prototypes actually. One is related to canonical typology that mainly uh, uh, the main reason for postulating something is cross-linguistic pervasiveness and sort of rationality of a construct. And then we also draw actually on, on uh, cognitive linguistics, so salience, and especially how this salience within a language, specific language system is very, very important. So this is like a, a it's, it's, it's a mixed typological and cognitive prototype. So for instance, one would expect that in situation of spontaneous language uh, uh, coinage, when someone uh, uh, like catastrophically uh, produces a new uh, conative calls or any interjection, because of salience and because also of frequency, uh, certain types of cognitive calls would be more expectable to, to emerge. And this is ex exactly this prototype that we would like to, to, to discover. And of course, it's, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, all cognitive calls or, or in interjections are like that. It doesn't even have to mean that the majority of them are like that. 
which is one of the tenets of canonical typology that uh, the, 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 the prototype in a way needs not to be commonly instantiated, even though each of the prototypical feature separately is common. So it's like a sort of abstract construct that is both related to cross-linguistic pervasiveness and cognitive salience. I, I don't know if that answers. <laughs> well, you know, that was actually perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And <laughs> I see that Bonnie sends put a follow-up question to that uh, in the chat. She asks um, you to test uh, Gil's claim that paralinguistic clicks decrease with distance from Africa. Is this also true for CACs? Alex, would you like to respond to that in regard to clicks decrease um, with distance from Africa? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question correctly, but uh, clicks are one of the uh, ones of the most pervasive extra systematic uh, sounds used actually in conative calls. So they, if if a language uh, uh, in many languages that don't have clicks in the normal uh, canonical repertoire, clicks are used very commonly in in when addressing uh, animals. That's something very 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 common. Right, so I, I suspect that with the calls for animals that you won't see that geographical patterning that was claimed. So it, it would be a nice uh, claim to uh, to contest in the literature. Yeah, I think I think this. Uh, uh, you you mean geographical uh, th that clicks? Yeah, are there's this uh, sort areas. of idea that. Yeah, I mean, this claim that's been made sort of implies that clicks were only invented once and that we lost them the further people left Africa. And mm. I, I think that that's kind of baloney. And um, yeah, the fact so, that they are used in animal calls everywhere would be a kind yes, of- Yes, exactly. Because in, in, in practically, in, in many Indo-European languages that I have looked into, and also in languages of Asia, which normally don't have any clicks in their in the repertoire, in, uh, in, like in, 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 in nouns or verbs or any standard uh, lexical class, the clicks are used in, in when addressing uh, animals. So, but of course they are uh, very extra systematic still within these respective language systems. Are there any other questions? No, then I think we're done for today with the questions and comments. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, September the 8th. Um, the presenters will be Hannah Gibson, Andrew Harvey, and Richard Griscom. And it's titled Clitic Complexes in the Tanzanian Rift Valley Area. And I would like to thank uh, Alexander and Michael uh, again for their presentation. Of course, everyone else for participating today. And I hope to see you again at our next webinar.